this is about cyber attacks, but it's actually going through an actual breach we had in Plymouth, um, which was a cyber breach. I'm not going to go in details about um, the data or um, who did what. It's just an overall um, uh, high view explanation of how we actually um, managed it when we discovered it, what we can do and what you can do afterwards. So back in about January, we got a notification that 29 email addresses and passwords have been found in a dump file, which is just a text file, um, on the web website VirusTotal. VirusTotal is just, um, it's a, it's a Google-owned website which allows people who've identified malware to upload it and they analyze it and identify it um, if it is malware and put it into virus, antivirus definitions. So why people put a password dump on there, we're unsure. Um, so the staff were contacted that were in there and they were asked to change the passwords in case they've been used for corporate access, which is a standard practice and um, something you wouldn't expect people to do, but just in case we get them to change the passwords. So um, on the whole, not, not really a major breach. Uh, because you do find password dumps occurring all the time. What we discovered on anal analysis of the pa um, information in there, the email addresses were all from the same department. There was some, some commonality about the passwords. They'd actually used very similar words in their passwords, which led to an indication that they'd been used on the same website. Because people don't think um, too much when they're using passwords. Quite often people reuse the name of the website in their password. So we found that and we were able to identify which website, and it was a website the council had commissioned, but it was hosted externally. So it was not on our infrastructure, um, but it did store data um, supplied by people external to the com um, council. So there was um, a range of data that um, we had control of, but other people have entered it into this website. So the first thing we did, we contacted the supplier and said, please switch it off. Um, we want to contain this breach, standard practice, and can you supply us a copy of all the data that's stored by the website? Because it is a, a database-driven website, so it had a lot of information on there. And can you supply all the available log files? Because we'd like to see what activity had been um, taking place on the website. And do you have any traffic statistics? So can we tell what <coughs> traffic had been going to this website, whether there was any unusual patterns? Um, so they did all that, which is great. We got that information within a day or so. Unfortunately, log files, because um, website hosting companies don't ha um, store a lot of log files because uh, the volume of data, we only had about three months worth of log files to go through, but that gave us enough to analyze um, what had been going on. We also asked the supplier, said, can you just look at the website and look at what you've developed, um, which is something linked into um, what Ian's just been talking about, to see if there's any vulnerabilities in the code or the, you know, the software. Um, and also, we got a full copy of the password dump file. Um, quite fortunate in to do that, so we were able to an anal analyze what information was in this dump file, and it, had, it did have 5.2 million passwords in there. So our 29 passwords were just a tiny percentage of what being placed. So we were able to compare the database that the website had with all the information in that um, dump file and conducted an impact assessment. So we looked at the data, um, did a sort of impact assessment to determine how um, sensitive that data was. And when we correlated the data in the dump file to the data on the website, we found it was much wider than 29 um, passwords. Because members of the public have been entering data onto this website, and their passwords and email addresses have been taken as well. Without actually having access to that um, dump file and the database and be able to do that correlation, we couldn't have told that, um, wouldn't have had any idea. So. To obtain that information was uh, a crucial step into that investigation. The log files, when we looked at them, I was a bit horrified. Uh, there were SQL injection attacks, and for those who are technical minded, um, that's where people are typing in 
um, SQL commands into a website and trying to retrieve all the data they can from that website. So that was going on all the time. There were thousands of these um, injection attacks. It looked by the nature of them because they were changing all the time. It was just somebody running an automated tool against the website. Uh, but that was enough to give us major cause for concern. So immediately we notified our CSIRO. That's a public sector uh, responsibility post within local government, central government, and other public sector organizations. It's a senior information risk owner, and that's within the council. It's one of our directors. They've got overall responsibility for protecting the data that the council has control over. We also notified CERT UK, which is the national investigation body for um, cyber incidents. And the initial advice was to contact law enforcement, which is not as easy as you'd think it might be. Phoning up the local police station, they don't really care about cyber incidents. Um, so I actually had a contact within Zephyr, which is the Southwest Cybercrime team, and said, how do we report this to you? They said, you need to report via um, a website called Action Fraud. So we did that. If anyone's actually seen the Action Fraud website, it's not the easiest reporting tool in the world. In fact, it, it's more focused on, not for cybercrime, but general fraud in, in, um, that occurs in the street. There was about 10 different pages to go through where I was just clicking through. Um, not applicable, a um, bit of a pain, but eventually got through to the end of the um, submission, click send, and within a day, Zephyr got in contact saying, fantastic, got your report. And they came down within about two weeks. Asked for all the information that we'd gathered, so they asked for the log files, they asked for a copy of the database, they asked for the, the traffic analysis, etc. They also got in contact with the supplier of the website, and we're linking in with them, um, and advised that we inform the Information Commissioner's Office, which we did. Um, their reporting tool is not really set up for this type of incident either. <coughs> and then we started about a lot of work internally. It, it took several weeks um, to work out, firstly, what do we tell people? Because we, we didn't know what data had been taken. All we knew, the only fact we had was um, passwords had been found in a dump file on a website that was used to um, analyze viruses. How it got there, we don't know. There were lots and lots of unanswered questions. So we um, initiated a communications plan. We got in the department that was involved in producing the website. We even got in the police. The local um, police came in and we had about a two hour meeting to discuss what do we tell people? Because what we didn't want to tell people is um, something that lead them to ask more questions and give them cause for concern. So we just put the letter together and said, we found this, our advice to you is to change your passwords um, and don't use the same password on a website. Uh, it did also affect people in the council. Um, there was a member of my team, uh, she'd actually been affected, so she came and spoke to me and, and she'd actually used the same password on every website. So I said, the first thing you need to do is just change that. Use a different password on every website. And so we sent out a letter to everyone affected and put a helpline in for people to contact us. Because that's the sort of thing the ICO likes to see happen. In breaches we've had before, um, where we've needed to report to the Information Commissioner's Office, the first thing we've done is put a helpline in so people who've got any concerns can phone up and they get, can get expert advice. Um, so we implemented that and sat back and waited for the, um, uh, the, c the contact from the public. We were quite shocked. There was a very, very low response. I think there were um, about two phone calls, if that. The details did make the local press our local paper, which likes to have a dig at the council. They, they had an article on their website about it, but it disappeared down the rankings really, really quickly. I think one of the people who got one of the letters we sent out, um, sent it to the paper, we made, um, gave them a press statement, 
and they put it on the website and there were no comments and the article disappeared really quickly. The ICO also got in contact and said, we're not interested. And I've put that down to the fact that cyber breaches um, is pretty, a fairly new thing for the um, Information Commission's office. Um, it's not like a hard drive being left in a, a bar and people gaining access to the information. There's a lot of unknowns about cyber attacks. So they said, because we've contacted the um, police and the police are investigating, they're not really interested. The actual investigation took months. And, and when I say months, probably about six months before we actually heard back from um, Zephyr. Uh, in the meantime, we needed to do something um, to replace the website. And all we did was implement a manual process. So we just put a form on our um, website for people to fill out and send the information in. And we didn't receive any negative feedback about doing that. The findings from the investigation were quite interesting. The attackers were from a foreign um, jurisdiction. Uh, the, the police have actually identified the country um, they believe the attack came from. It's in the far uh, in the Middle East somewhere. There's nothing they can do about it. However, they did take great steps to um, hide their identities. They were using tools to um, make it they were coming from the UK and the USA and all sorts of different places. So it looked as if, as if there were thousands and thousands of people trying to attack this website when the, the police actually believe it's probably only maybe one, maybe two, all coming from the same place. And their main target was just the passwords and email addresses because they are the things that have got value on the dark web. The rest of the data on the website they weren't interested in. Um, but passwords, um, if people use the same password on every website, there's a potential to gain a lot more information. Um, and criminals effectively are doing this for a financial gain. Now, um, the data actually was taken after the website has a bit become obsolete. Uh, the website was only supposed to be live for a finite amount of time. And we, we discovered that this website had just been left open and was still running, and there was no need for that website to be running. Um, so we've actually put in processes to make sure if a website um, has expired um, and gone past its um, useful life, we just decommission it, get the data deleted, and it's not a problem. Uh, linking in with what Ian said, uh, one thing we did discover looking at the code of the website, uh, that it didn't have the required security built in at the development stage. When you've got uh, websites with input fields, you expect them to validate things and um, commands such as SQL injection commands. You would expect it should filter those out, um, <coughs> and it didn't. And also there were a couple of other things about, about how it actually stored and, and the encryption on the data um, allowed that data to be extracted quite easily. Um, so it was all about the development. Um, of the website, but when we actually commissioned it, we didn't stipulate the level of security we wanted, we didn't stipulate what type of data would be on there, so as, as per standard website development, the guy just went ahead and did what we asked. Uh, we also felt that the log file retention was fairly insufficient, it was only three months, we would expect you know, potentially all the logs for when that website was commissioned to be available. But yet again, we hadn't stipulated that um, in the contract. And for the supplier to be able to do that, they would need to have a lot more data storage. And the hosting company didn't really have the traffic analysis available for extended periods. Because likewise, the amount of storage required to store that data um, would have been quite high. And there's a cost to doing that. So that's the findings we had from the um, from the breach. It was a massive lesson learned. Um, there's a lot of things we've actually put in place since. One thing we have learned is this a one-off. Well, for those of you who have been watching the press recently and spotted that there might be a very, very large company that's had 200 million passwords and um, email addresses stolen, no, it's not a one-off. This is happening all the time to a lot of data and a lot of websites. And these type of dump files are appearing on 
websites such as Virus Total on a, an alarming basis. Um, the 200 million passwords and email addresses, they are actually up for sale um, at quite a reasonable price in the, in the dark web. Um, the concerning thing is, these data breaches have been going on for a long time. We're playing a bit of a catch-up game. Um, with website development, in the early days of the web, people would just use a built-in Microsoft tool, type in a few um, fancy pictures, and upload it to the web, and there was no security at all. That historical data is still available in a lot of cases, and even though it might be um, not directly accessible, there's web archiving systems such as um, Wayback Web, which have still got all this data and they, they take copies of it. So you can actually go back and get some very historical data, which might have been protected by a very insecure website. And the concerning thing is the cyber criminals have been doing this and they've been ahead of the game for a long time. And uh, going back to what Ian said, we've still got websites being developed insecurely. One, because when they're being commissioned, people aren't stipulating, actually, this is protecting this level of data. There, there's also a great lack of understanding about the value of data. People don't understand what a, a username and a password, what that's actually worth on the dark web, what people can do with it. And even if people use a formula and uh, sort of part of the website, that potentially could be used um, for further gain and to be able to gain access to more valuable websites. And of course we've got the complexity of modern websites where they're linking in with, they're pulling information from social media feeds and adverts and all various other places. That complexity means there's a greater chance of vulnerabilities being introduced and it, it is a big concern. Now, there are things you can do about this. One thing we're actually doing now is impact assessing all websites that process your data. And that goes for your personal life as well. If you've actually entered in information into a website you know, at home, just have a think about, do you actually need to have all that data? Can you ask, ask the website to delete it if you don't need it, you're not using it anymore? Because we've actually spotted, I mean, um, some of the notifications we've received have been from national websites and the data is about four or five years old and it's been staff members that have left. Um, so it's, it's not needed anymore. That, that person should have deleted that data, but people don't do that. We are very bad at um, deleting things and getting rid of information. Very good at putting it onto websites and signing up for things. And I guarantee everyone in this room, you will not know every single website your data's on. So it is a hard thing to do, but um, we need to get smarter in this type of thing and start actually applying our own retention um, and disposal policies to our own data. Another thing you can do when you actually commission a website, um, if you're doing it as part of an organization, actually insist that it's um, developed securely. There's a, a something known as OWASP, which is the Open Web Application Security Protocol, I think it's called. They've got a top 10 um, list of vulnerabilities. If you actually stipulate that you, any website you commission has been developed with those in mind, and, and this organization actually tells you how to develop websites securely, um, you're 80% of the way to actually protecting your data. If a website's already accredited, so they've been pen tested, and they've actually got a, a badge to say, yeah, this has been tested by an external tester, um, that's a good way of identifying a website to use. Th there isn't anything na nationwide that does that at the moment, which is a bit of a concern. We've signed up to CISP. Some of you will be aware of what CISP is. It's um, part of CERT UK. It's an information sharing um, website. And we've actually had notifications that our um, information has been dumped uh, by CISP. Unfortunately, they didn't manage it very well. They put on a, a, a notification that if you're with a public sector organization, please contact them because they found .gov.uk addresses in a dump file on the internet. 
and that caused a bit of chaos in the way that was managed. But if you actually sign up to CISP, they can actually notify you if your information is in there. There's other websites such as Have I Been um, Pwned, which is um, you can type your email address in and it tells you whether your um, that email address has been breached. Um, I found that Adobe is one of the um, biggest concerns. Um, it seems to be nearly every email address that signed up to Adobe has been breached. Um, you can also monitor websites like um, Virus Total. It's free to actually monitor and, and um, have a look at it. Pastebin is another one where a lot of information has been put in. And I know one of my colleagues in the Southwest Warp has looked at writing a little um, piece of code which can pull off and um, whether their organization has been affected. Um, and there's potential for the students in here to look at tools to um, conduct automatic monitoring on that. And the next most important thing you can do as an organization is to have a response plan in place. Part of the response plan, I mean firstly you need to analyze what's affected very very quickly. Make sure that that, that breach cannot be um, conducted again so switch off anything um, I found in the past. If there's a website, a web server, specific web server that's been compromised, just unplug it. Unplug it from the network, pull it out, do an analysis offline. Unfortunately, if it's an externally hosted system, it's not that easy to do that, but you can contact the supplier and they will switch it off. Some of the bigger, um, higher profile breaches that have occurred in the past, and um, I think the Sony PlayStation Network was the biggest one I can think of, that they actually turned off access to the PlayStation Network for about a month and caused a lot of distress amongst um, gamers. But they took the right action. They, they stopped a further breach happening. If you can, if, you, if you've got a, a data dump like this, identify any commonality. Identify the website affected. It could be an internal one, very likely to be an external one. People are putting data all over the internet now. There is a, a lack of visibility whether something is actually internal or external in some cases, and especially with some of the departments we're dealing with. And um, obtain as much of the original data, the log files, um, so we can actually assess what the, the scope of um, the, the breach is. And impact assessments, totally crucial. For example, with the CISP notification, when we actually identified the website that was affected, we didn't even bother doing a, an impact assessment because it was a nationwide retailer, um, very low level in, um, impact on ourselves. But one thing we did realize, actually, if that website has been compromised and the information had been taken from there, then that website could have been compromised to deliver malware. So. The most prudent action to take in that, that case was actually to block access to that website until they fixed the issues. And we're finding a lot of these breaches um, are linked with that. There's been some very high profile um, ransomware attacks in the last six months that have actually come from compromised websites, um, which are known as watering hose, and it's actually trusted um, nationwide websites that have been compromised. <coughs> So if you do get any indication that a particular website is compromised, first thing you do is block access to it as well. In your response plan, it's very important you've got the um, appropriate escalation. So if you've got access to your CSIRO, if you know how to report to the um, your local Zephyr team, to the ICO, um, and engage with CERT, uh, the quicker and the easier you can do that, the better. Because they're, they're, they're there to help you. They're, they're very good. They've got some very detailed tools. Um, with the data we had, they were able to um, put that into a tool they had and see if it had been used for further compromises. And that gives us reassurance that it actually hadn't been. Um, getting all the relevant data, that can be a bit of a problem. But you've got to make sure that that's in the contract, that if it's a commissioned website, that you can get that data if needed. And there's always going to be lessons learned from your response plan. 
and make sure you actually identify those lessons learned. The big lesson we learned is we need to fully understand what data we've got, where it is, and actually put that in the contracts so that it's managed properly. Now, what can we do nationally? And this links in with um, what Ian was saying. If we had a national scheme to have websites tested and accredited with mon uh, monitoring standards and breach notification, that would go a long way to stopping these breaches occurring. We found sharing intelligence within local regions, that can be crucial. And if you've got links and you can actually do um, share some intelligence, you can help other people um, reduce the um, chance of a breach. So if you know a website's been compromised and you share that with all, all your partners and in a regional network, um, they can also block access and make sure that they're not compromised. Uh, I'd like to see a better way to notify of, of this type of breach. Uh, action fraud, very good for reporting certain types of fraud. For a cyber breach, um, it could be improved. And we've now got the National Cyber Security Centre. They're looking at the sort of services they're going to be running, and there's lots of private companies involved, private security specialists have actually um, been involved with building this cyber security centre. They are actually starting to look at this information and notify people when you get them breached. Um, and they're f focusing on some very specific public sector areas at the moment because one of their concerns is protecting the national infrastructure. And as I said, simplifying the reporting process and getting people to understand what they can and what they need to report and what information they need to supply. Having that up front um, as part of your response plan, that will make it a lot easier in the future. So that's a, just a quick high level overview of the breach we had, how we managed it and what we can do about it. And that's been, in the last six months, quite a bit of fun we had and a massive learning curve.